going to be talking about is physics, basically. I, I mean, uh, I'm uh, the musical acoustics research group, but it's in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh. And so for many years I've been teaching physics students, but also music students. Because from the 19th century onwards, uh, there's been uh, a feeling at Edinburgh when the music department was first founded in the 1850s or so that um, one of the important things was that music students should be taught a little science so they could understand how the musical instruments work and how musical sound works. And that was very enlightened at the time. Uh, so I found that very interesting because I'm an enthusiastic musician, as is my wife Patsy, uh, but also, of course, working in physics, I felt, well, physics can explain everything, can't it? So uh, should be able to explain music too. Uh, turns out to be a lot more complicated than you might think, like most <laughs> applications of physics. The, the basic laws are fairly simple, but uh, actually trying to explain how uh, they work in practice involves lots of fascinating complexities. And the introduction mentioned one or two of these. I'm not going to go into the nonlinear dynamics of uh, the lip motion in this talk, because what I'm going to be doing is really trying to show you some ways in which, as, as teachers of primary or secondary school children, you could actually uh, find lots of interesting examples of physics in action uh, in the realm of music and musical instruments and musical sounds, which is something which I think everybody finds interesting, because everybody uh, is involved with music and reacts to music in some way or another. You only have to look at all the kids wandering around permanently with their uh, iPods on and listening to music nowadays to realize that that's just as true as it ever was. And also, of course, many uh, youngsters are learning musical instruments and are interested to understand how their instruments and other instruments work. So, uh, but many uh, school projects and uh, university undergraduate projects too. In fact, my research work uh, had developed out of uh, the fact that when I was put in charge of the undergraduate final year physics laboratory at Edinburgh, uh, I thought it would be fun to get a few uh, experiments uh, on musical instruments, which will all be quite simple and easy to understand for the students. Turns out they're not as simple as all that, but uh, uh, I'll try and show you a little bit of that in the next hour or so. So uh, we've got various instruments here. Uh, got a violin in the background somewhere, a uh, stringed instrument, uh, one or two other odd instruments, and some more familiar instruments like trumpets and trombones. I don't know, are any musicians here? Any? Anybody play any? Yeah? yeah? What's your? Guitar and drums. Guitar and drums, right. Any other? Uh, just sort of we'll talk to you, yeah? Guitar, piano. Yeah? Piano, piano right. So what was your one? Uh, guitar, badly, drums, badly, harmonica, badly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, this is not an audition, it's just to <laughs> work out what, what the background is. Yeah. Okay, so well, we're going to start, in fact, um, with stringed instruments. But just before that, I, I'd like to do a little bit of a kind of uh, preliminary talk about um, the nature of musical sound and how you can actually analyse it uh, and describe it and measure it quantitatively. Uh, sound, as you all know, is a, a vibration uh, transmitted through the air in longitudinal sound waves. I'm assuming that's sort of common knowledge. Um, so uh, when we're creating musical sounds, we're basically creating vibrations in the air and we're transmitting these waves which are compressions and expansions in the pressure. So uh, when I'm not talking, we've got the ambient pressure of 10 to the 5 pascals in the room. And then when I talk or make any noise, what I'm doing is I'm creating a fluctuation in that pressure. And that local fluctuation which I'm creating here uh, creates a sound wave, which is a longitudinal wave which travels throughout the room. Eventually it reaches your ear, and it causes a pressure variation at your eardrum, which pushes your ear in and out, and so you perceive sound. And uh, <coughs> a microphone, that a uh, little microphone here, uh, is effectively doing the same kind of thing as your ear does. Uh, it's responding to sound by uh, the pressure pushes the eardrum 
in, pushes the microphone down from in, pushes it out again, and here there's an electromechanical transducer which turns that into an electrical signal which we can see. And with the advantage of the modern computational techniques and things, it's actually possible to use software to look at sound waves. And I think most of you are probably familiar with Audacity. Are you? Are you is that something that everybody's used? Or yeah. Um, so I, I thought we'd start there, perhaps, um, just to look at one or two things that Audacity can do. Uh, obviously, uh, let's just uh, get it running. So if I just uh, <coughs> make a sound, then <coughs> If it's working, it will, yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> and if we just look at the nature of that sound, <clears throat> yeah. then uh, you, you'd find that quite a lot of, of school pupils at, at some stages or other are very familiar with this and already recording their own things and using this to kind of... Uh, do the, the processing and the editing of their, their bands and so on. But uh, from a basic point, scientific point of view, it's of course interesting that you can look at waveforms and if you look at the waveform just by expanding it, um, if we just uh, expand it a bit, um, then you, you see the actual waveform of the sound. And what I wanted to, to just draw, draw to your attention is that even with a fairly complicated sound, like the one I was making with my voice, uh, you can see a periodicity in that. That is to say, uh, it repeats itself regularly. Um, if you just take the point there, for example, then you see uh, the decreasing peaks and then another large one and then two decreasing peaks and a large one, two decreasing peaks and a large one. So in fact there is a periodicity there. And that periodicity is associated with the sense of pitch. When when I, I was I was singing a note there and uh, that you find that periodic waveform and that's associated with the pitch of the note. So uh, if you've got a sound which isn't a pitched sound, then uh, you wouldn't get that. Uh, for example, um, if you just take a, a sound like this, it's got a, a, not a very strong sense of pitch anyway. So if we record that, um, let's just try doing that. Actually, probably a, a better unpitched one is something like that, just a, a rapper. You can't really do any obvious note in that. If I said, Sing that note, you wouldn't know what to do with it. Um, so uh, let's just try seeing what that waveform looks like. So then we just need to stop it and have a little look. If you just look anywhere, <clears throat> doesn't matter where you look, you can expand it up. Okay, and you want to find a, a periodicity there. So, so, however much you, you, you try, you can find some regularity. It gets a little smaller and it gets a little bigger, but it's not actually repeating itself. It's essentially a kind of random uh, sound, rather than the pitch sound that we get from an instrument. And one of the uh, the fun things about this actually is that, of course, all of these periodic waveforms are waveforms which repeat themselves regularly. Now what's the simplest possible repeating waveform? Uh, a sine wave, yes. So uh, you can create a sine wave, of course, with a sine wave generator. Um, but when I was singing that sound, uh, it was a much more complicated thing than a sine wave. But can you sing a sine wave? Do you think you could actually sing that sound? Well, you know what a, si a sine wave sounds like. I think you've probably all played sine waves you know, in the physics classroom. So uh, it's sort of... Isn't it? Something like that. 
So let's just see. Um, just take fill out and start again. Okay, where are we? Oh yeah, so it's this one. It's this one we have to do. So if you just try singing, you know. Well, let's just see, does that look anything like a sine wave? What we need to do is expand it in the middle and have a look. It's not too bad, is it? So you can try and do better, you know, it's a slightly wonky sine wave, so a little bit of practice. Actually, I think female voices find that a little bit easier than male voices. Uh, you can just try and go in and uh, uh, look at it and see whether you're really doing a sign of Okay, now, but with this kind of uh, thing, uh, you can do other things too. Because um, while we're looking at audacity here, I just want to show you something we'll come on to more when we're looking at uh, the wind instruments, uh, which is that you can actually look at uh, sine waves which are created not just uh, by some kind of sound source, although it is very interesting to look at the different waveforms that you get. For instance, if you just use a voice in different uh, ah, e, oh, you know, you see how the waveforms change. But um, you can look at sine waves created, for example, inside a tube. Um, uh, you know, one of the standard things in, in physics is looking at the resonances in, in a tube. And I would just had a uh, the email a few days ago from a student doing a, a school project uh, about resonance and wondering uh, how to deal with resonances in tubes. Well, here's one thing you can do just with uh, a computer with Audacity and, uh, uh, and a tube. You just get a little microphone like that, just a standard sort of uh, throat microphone, I stick it in the end, and then uh, you can actually look at um, what happens in a tube like this. Uh, let's just I'll just give you a quick example. You can play with this in different ways. But if you want to see um, what, what are the standard frequencies of a tube like this, um, let's say with one end closed. Well, with one end closed, uh, you would expect to get a set of odd harmonics, OK? Because you've got a, a pressure node at the closed end, a pressure node at the open end. So uh, one simple way of doing that is just to drop one end into a uh, glass of water. Because when you do that, of course, you, you close the end. But not only that, uh, you send a pressure pulse up the tube. So you're, in effect, uh, exciting it with an impulse of excitation. Um, so I must admit, I just thought of that this morning as I was setting this up. I thought, I wonder if that would work. And it does, so I thought I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> so if we just do that, and then we just sort of stick this in here. It worked last time, didn't it? So what you see there, stop it from what we see that I'll just uh, trim out a bit, it doesn't really matter. It's a rather nice kind of uh, uh, decaying oscillation because the impulse that you created when you popped it in uh, sent a pulse up the thing, which is quite a nice kind of uh, impulsive pulse. And then you've just got the decay. You could do all sorts of things. You could measure the rate of decay of that, for instance. Um, but um, you can also look at the, at the frequency spectrum of it. Now, it's not actually a sine wave, of course, because what was uh, excited in there was not... Uh, just uh, one resonance, but a whole set of uh, standing waves at odd multiples of the basic frequency. Right? So, <coughs> uh, in Audacity, there's a, <coughs> a, a plot spectrum uh, thing. I don't know if you've used that, have you? Uh, if you uh, 
just select that bit where we've got the sound. Oh, we'll just have a listen to it, maybe see what it sounds like. Uh, oh, I need to put this in there. So that was the sound. Boom. Okay? And that's basically just the sound you get if you just did. But it's a little dangerous to do with your hand, I've found, because it's very easy to overload the little microphone if you do that. It's quite a, a, a loud sound. And if you overload it, of course, you start getting distortion harmonics, and so it uh, doesn't prove what you hope it will. Uh, so it's quite important to do something like control like that, so you can just control how hard you pop it into the water and make sure that it's not overloading. So let's just see if we just select on that. Don't do that much. And then, go okay. sometimes this appears in different places, but in this version of Audacity, any rate, it's <coughs> analyze, and then you'll find a plot spectrum command. Okay. So what you've got then there is the frequency spectrum. And I've put it on a logarithmic scale, um, just so you can see there's the, the, the first frequency. Uh, and uh, there's actually a, 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 a peak searching uh, algorithm in here. It's quite clever. So it tells you that the nearest peak to the cursor there, sort of locked onto that, is at uh, 115 hertz. Now, I suspect that's the next major one. Yes, that's right. That's at 336 hertz, which is three times the, the fundamental. Okay, And um, then that's the... the the one at, at uh, 582, which, so it's about 600 times. So, roughly speaking, it's um, 100. Uh, no, wait a minute. Should it, yeah, uh, what, what should we do? Uh, yeah, that's right. In actual fact, it looks as though we've got some even harmonics there as well. If this, you do this properly, you should only get the odd harmonic. So, uh, I maybe just did overload it a little bit. Let's just uh, do one more and just check whether that's true or not. Um, a little bit more gently. Okay, that's certainly not overloaded. So if we just look at this a little bit, I'll not bother. That looks a bit cleaner now. Uh, you can still see a little bit more, but there you've got the, the main peak, which is 115 hertz again. So the, the next one should be three times that frequency, okay? Or 345. So that would be this one. 340, well, it's close enough. It's within a few hertz. And then the next one will be five times that. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so <coughs> just a little illustration of the kind of things you can play with with Audacity that uh, uh, actually take you a bit further than just simply looking at waveforms. Another bit of software, though, which is actually very useful, is... Um, uh, a spectrum uh, or a spectrogram program, which will be able to do real-time analysis like this. And Voce Vista is a, is a, is a good one. Um, it's not completely free, but it's pretty cheap. So I'll just show you that one too before we go on to a little more detail at the instrument. Anybody familiar with that program? Uh, it was an was a, um, Israeli acoustics colleague of mine who pointed it out to me and said, look, this is really good. You know, for uh, relatively straightforward things, it's actually uh, not terribly flexible. Uh, there are other spectrum analysis programs that you can get, you know, uh, you can steer to do exactly what you want. But this is simple to operate, and you can do quite a lot with it.
So there, it's running at the moment, and you see what it's doing is it's actually just doing a real-time analysis. So in fact, uh, what it's doing is taking a series of short time windows of uh, just a few tens of milliseconds, and it's doing a, a frequency transform, a Fourier transform of that, so it's measuring the frequency content. Is everybody familiar with what I mean by that, or do I need to... I'm, I'm not quite sure what your background is, whether you're all... Uh, uh, all familiar with uh, uh, the idea of Fourier analysis. Yeah? Uh, so you're analyzing the sound, uh, a, a waveform, into the sine wave components. And um, you know, when I'm explaining that to uh, children, I often say, if you imagine you can set yourself up as a choir, uh, and everybody can sing a sine wave, having shown that you can sing a sine wave, then if you get the choir to sing, a sine wave with just the right frequency and just the right amplitude and just the right phase, and each person sings just the right sine wave component, you could build up any sound, whether it's periodic or not, as a matter of fact. But if it's periodic, it's a set of harmonic frequency components that you want. And we'll come back to that later. So, um, <clears throat> but this actually is an analyzing the sound I'm creating and uh, just trying to tell us what it does. I think I could take that out, actually, mm -hmm. and just use an internal microphone there, actually. For the most straightforward. Um, so <clears throat> there, uh, with my voice, I'm creating all sorts of sounds. And on the right-hand side, it's a standard spectrum uh, thing. So this is frequency from 0 to 4 kilohertz that way. Uh, amplitude in decibels of uh, 60 decibel range uh, up vertically. Uh, and time uh, just uh, goes by, of course. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, it's a spectrogram display, so now the frequency is vertical rather than horizontal, and the amplitude is shown by a color scale, red meaning very loud and uh, blue meaning pretty quiet. Uh, and so you can see that um, uh, my voice has got a lot of different frequency components in it, and you can't see any obvious uh, periodicity perhaps, but if I sung a note, ah. Then you see it's looking a bit more regular. So that's the kind of thing I was doing when we saw the periodic waveform. And uh, uh, Fourier's theorem tells you, as I said, that if it's a periodic waveform, then it will have a set of harmonically related frequency components. That is, there'll be one, the lowest one, at a certain frequency, and then the next one will be just twice that frequency, and the next one three times that frequency, and so on. Now, Although they're equally spaced in frequency, they're not equally spaced in pitch. But let me just, before I turn to that, just uh, try one or two other things with one or two of the instruments I've got. Uh, instruments which, of course, mostly generate pitched sounds. So let's just take the violin. So if I just play a note on the violin. Let's just arrange this so I can stop it quickly and have a look. Let's just we'll try again. We'll stop it there. Then uh, what you've got here is the frequency spectrum up this way. So you can see that there's a set of frequency components. One frequency there. Uh, this is the zero level here, that left line. So. The second one is just twice as high, the third one three times as high, the fourth one four times as high, the fifth one five times as high, so they're obviously harmonics. And if we set the cursor in the middle of that, then we see the corresponding frequency spectrum here, uh, rather weak on the fundamental there, uh, but let me just uh, turn this thing so it's a bit more flat on the ladder, just at that point. Okay, and so here we've now got frequency displayed horizontally, so that's zero hertz there. So the first big peak is that one, and then the second one is just twice as far over, the third one three times, four times, five times, okay? Now, it's quite interesting that in this case, uh, the lowest one in frequency is actually also the lowest one in amplitude. Uh, and this is often called the fundamental, and these are called the overtones, or upper harmonics. I prefer just to call them all harmonics and uh, not say that was the fundamental, because although it is the lowest frequency, it's not necessarily the biggest. And people are often surprised by that. And in fact, in many things, if you just look up uh, 
sort of things on the web, for instance, Wikipedia articles and so on, you're quite likely to find people saying uh, the fundamental is the one which gives the sense of pitch, and then uh, there's a lot of smaller upper harmonics which give you the kind of timbre of the sound. But that's not really the case. Um, you could, in fact, have a very, very small uh, fundamental. And let's just take the G string of a violin, and uh, the lowest frequency is very weak. Now, you see, on that low note, you've got lots of harmonics. Some of them are quite large, and even getting into the red, which is uh, very, very big. So in fact, if I go there, I'll need to reduce the, the range. Uh, so we'll bring it up to say 80 decimal, that looks better. Okay, so now you see you've got a sound, which is still a pitched sound, of course, as the violin makes pitched sounds. And so you've got this sort of set of horizontal bars, like the bar of, bars of a gate, you can instantly recognize a uh, harmonic frequency spectrum or a spectrogram just because it's a set of equally spaced uh, frequency components. And that's the corresponding uh, thing to a uh, periodic waveform in terms of the time domain, as we say, uh, and to a pitched sound in music, which is so important. But you see here, uh, this one is light blue, and this one's red corresponding to the fact that this one is actually about 20 decibels larger than that one. So uh, on the violin, uh, the so-called fundamental of the G-string is actually an all not insignificant component, but it's very weak compared to lots of the other ones. So that's quite an interesting thing that you can see just by looking at, uh, at instruments like that. You know, so if you've got um, people around for learning the violin or something like that, you can get to demonstrate this kind of thing. Okay, well, <coughs> that's the sound of, uh, of a violin with lots of uh, upper harmonics there. Uh, that was the G string. If I play the same note on a, on a trumpet, for example, <coughs> you'll get a different frequency spectrum. Uh, and again. So that's the sound of a trumpet, which is a little bit playing the same note. Um, but you see, it's got a different uh, kind of uh, frequency spectrum. In fact, uh, <clears throat> depending on the note you play, the frequency spectrum would be quite different too. If I play the higher note, you get a different balance between the fundamental and the upper harmonics. So every instrument has its own characteristic timbre, of course, which varies from note to note. And you can see these differences if you look at the uh, spectrograms or the, the frequency spectra, which you can do rather nicely with Audacity. Now, it's a rather curious thing when you look at this that you've got all of these different components. Okay, uh, many many of these different frequencies present in the sound, but you don't hear lots of different notes, do you? Uh, you only hear one note. When I play this, what I'm saying to you is that uh, there's about twenty different sine waves hitting your ear with different harmonically related frequencies. But you don't hear 20 different notes. And that's because they're harmonically related. And your brain is uh, somehow or other programmed or, or uh, organized to treat harmonic spectra in a very special way. Uh, it fuses the sounds together into one perceived pitch rather than hearing them separately. So uh, if we just do a little here. Um, just, uh, uh, way back to Pythagoras, uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, they recognized uh, this 
importance of harmonics in the sense that they're simple whole number ratios. You know, the second harmonic is just twice the frequency of the first. Uh, the third harmonic is just three times the frequency of the first. And in fact, <coughs> he discovered that by doing, this is a medieval woodcut, just an uh, idea of what the medieval people thought Pythagoras did, of course, nobody really knows. But uh, there's a description of dividing strings into, uh, say, a half and a third and a quarter, and finding that these intervals are very important. So uh, if you take the violin, and then you just, say, touch the string lightly halfway along, the note goes up an octave. That's a frequency ratio of two. And then if you divide it into a third, and it goes up to another note, up a musical fifth of that. That's a quarter of the way along. Okay? Now, it's interesting to see what happens uh, when you do that and look at the spectrogram. We'll look back at that in a minute. But I just wanted to point out that Pythagoras realized that dividing the string by integer numbers, uh, uh, divided by two, divided by three, divided by four, give you musically important intervals. And um, in fact, these are the, are the intervals as musicians describe them. Um, but you've just heard them on the, on the violin. However, you'll hear them again, because I've just programmed them into the computer here. So um, I'll just play you one or two. For instance, here's um, a sine wave at 220 hertz. Everybody hear that? Okay. Now, we double the frequency. Musically, it's up an octave. It's almost the same note. Isn't it? If, I, if I said to you, sing that note, some of you would probably sing, ah, uh, some of you sing, ah. Uh, depending on your sex, probably. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, you think it's the same note because an octave is a fundamental musical relationship. But then you might think, well, okay, we've added 220 hertz, we've got the 440 hertz. If we want to go up another octave, what do we do? 660 hertz. Mm, well, let's try it. Remember, I'll, I'll, uh, that one was... So here's... Uh, that's a bitter. This one is 660 hertz. Okay, it's not up an octave, it's up a fifth. In fact, you've got to go up to 880 hertz to get up the next octave. Okay, and, uh, and then if you go up another 220 hertz, you go up a major third, and finally up to the sixth harmonic. Which is 1320. Now, so the interesting thing though is adding them together. So if we just start with the first one again, and then we add the second one to it. You can hear the two, but they kind of blend together. And in actual fact, if I hadn't played you the single sine wave first, you probably wouldn't register that there was two different components in it, because it sort of blends. And we'll not spend a lot of time on this. Let's just look at uh, one, two, three, and four added together. See, it starts just to hear like a complicated sound, rather than four separate harmonics. And if we add six together, one, two, three, four, five, and six, So you can sort of half hear them, but really they, they kind of always blend in. And so uh, these are all present in the musical instrument sounds. You know? But when you hear it in a realistic musical situation, you don't recognize the fact that there's all these different components, because your brain has that very special approach to uh, that kind of uh, waveform, and that kind of uh, periodic uh, frequency spectrum. Okay. Uh, the, 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 what I was keep jumping on to was uh, something I just uh, was demonstrating to another group. I'll just play you a little bit. If you just take this little bit from Ravel's Bolero, just to hear the, the musical sound. This is the, that's it. That's it. You don't want that one. Um, okay. 
that, that's it, the, the tune just plays in a sine wave. Um, but if we add, say, um, four harmonics together, when you hear it in the musical context, it, you, you stop thinking of it as four separate sine waves all going along, uh, but you, you just think of it as a kind of buzzy, oboe-like sound. But of course, if we analyzed it we're using uh, Audacity or uh, Voce Vista, you'd see that they're all there all the time. So I think that's a quite interesting. Um, OK, so uh, as I said, we're going to just have a quick look at stringed instruments and how we can uh, look at some of this background in relation to the actual vibration behavior of the instrument. So a violin. It's a box. Uh, well, OK, we've got some guitar players here, even no violin players. So a box with some strings on it. And the strings are stretched. And the strings are kind of uniform thickness. And they're pretty flexible. So uh, you get a set of uh, standing waves built up on the strings. Because uh, the string has a sound wave which travels, transverse vibration travels along it. Of course, if you pluck a string, you, it gets sort of blurred, so you can see it's moving. But the vibrations that we listen to in, on the violin are a few hundred times a second. So you can't actually see that. You can't, can't follow it. But um, it's quite nice just to look at that kind of vibration using um, one of the, my favorite demonstrations, which is also one of the cheapest, just a bit of elastic string. Um, it's quite important that it's elastic. You know, uh, it's not just string, uh, because you've got to be able to put a tension on it and a controlled tension. So, thank you, Patsy. Uh, so if you can sort of stretch it out and adjust what the, what the tension is going to be or have it around your finger. So, you can also, but you can see what happens when you pluck the violin string or the guitar string. generates a sound. What is actually happening on the string? Well, you just pluck it and you can see in this one because it's going slowly now. Can you see what happens? Is that there's a pulse travels along the string. If I just sort of do that, then let it go, then the pulse shuttles backwards and forwards. It reaches Patsy's hand, bounces off, and in fact, if you look carefully, you can possibly see that it inverts itself. If I pluck it down, a downward pulse comes back as an upward pulse. Because, of course, Patsy's hand is imposing a rigid end, more or less. And so <clears throat> the downward force that the string is exerting on our hand is balanced by an equal and opposite upward force from our hand if the end of the string is going to remain motionless. That's Newton's laws, right? So, uh, in effect, in order to keep that rigid, she's having to give it an upward pull every time that pulse comes along, pulling from below. And so she's effectively sending an inverted pulse back again. Doesn't have to think about it. I mean, if I just tied that to a hook on the wall, it would have done the same thing. You don't have to be clever to do it. It's just Newton's laws, <laughs> right? So, um, so that pulse is going backwards and forwards, and there's a certain natural frequency which is just determined by the speed at which the wave travels. And so, of course, uh, you know, you can demonstrate things like if you make the thing tighter. Uh, this is Melvi's experiment, actually, but done uh, without using electrical vibrators. If you make the string tighter, the pulses go backwards and forwards faster, and therefore obviously the frequency goes up. Okay? Um, but the interesting thing is that there's resonances of the string, of course. Uh, there's, if you like, a natural frequency there, just determined by the fact that it takes a certain time for the pulse to go backwards and forwards, depending on the speed of transverse waves on the string. So here we've got a natural frequency one, two, three, four. And that's related to the setting up of standing waves on the string. At the moment, we're just looking to a wave traveling backwards and forwards, a pulse. But if I feed in energy sinusoidally at that frequency, just by wiggling two, three, four, five, then you build up that big amplitude, of course. Okay. Now, it's important to realize that that is not what we saw the string doing when you pluck it. Okay. That's one of the natural modes of the string. 
Now, if you vibrate the string at just twice that frequency, you'll find another natural mode. One, two, so I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then you get another natural mode, but now its mode shape is different, okay? It's divided into two sections, and the section nearest Patsy goes up while my end goes down, and there's a kind of nodal point hovering around roughly in the middle, okay? And then if you do it three times, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three again, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, you get the three bumps of two nodes, and four times, oh, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, okay? And so you can go on, uh, depending on how energetic you are. Uh, <laughs> uh, as I say, no electrical uh, vibrators here, it's just all done manually. Um, but the point is that you can see all sorts of things about that. You can see the fact that the phase changes, for instance, every time you go across a nodal point. Um, you can see that uh, uh, the frequencies are harmonically related, because if you're just vibrating them three, four times or whatever you started with. Uh, and also, uh, you can see that that kind of set of vibrations uh, has a set of different mode shapes. Now, the interesting step, of course, which is probably going a bit too far, certainly for primary school kids, but um, the interesting thing is that that um, vibration that we saw first, with the pulse shuttling backwards and forwards, is in fact a superposition of all these different modes with appropriate amplitudes and phases. Now, uh, that was something which was hard for the kind of um, 18th century people to accept. And people like D'Alembert and Lagrand and so on argued about whether it was possible for a string to vibrate simultaneously in all these different shapes. Surely it must do either one or the other. Uh, but of course, with, with something like this, you can see that that's indeed what it's doing. Because um, each one of these is generating its own characteristic frequency. And it's feeding that frequency to the bridge of the instrument, radiating it as sound. So uh, we just, um, it's not bowing this time, it's just uh, plucking the string. If I just pluck the string. Okay, so then you see that's the, the fundamental mode there. Um, and then there's the second mode with two bumps. There's the third mode with three bumps, and the fourth mode with four bumps, and so on there. They decay with different rates, but they're all there. And in fact, that business about uh, touching the string halfway along, let's, let's take the second string. What I'm doing there, I'm, I'm not pressing the string down, I'm just touching the string lightly halfway along it. So what's happening there? Well, I'm forcing there to be a displacement node at the middle of the string, as well as at each end. So I'm killing that first mode, which was the up and down with maximum vibration in the middle, but I'm not killing the second one, because it would want this to be at rest there anyway. You can imagine if a big fat finger had been there when I was doing the second one, it wouldn't have mattered, but it would have stopped the first one. And you can see that on here, if we just... Well, I'll just play... So if I just play the, the thing and then I'll touch it, you see, what, what's happened is when I touched the string halfway along, I killed the first one, but I left the second one. I killed the third one too, because that's another one with an anti node in the middle. I left the fourth one. Okay? So, musicians, uh, sound, I mean, violinists describe that as playing harmonics. And they're not strictly speaking playing harmonics, because that's the second harmonic, but. They're actually playing the fourth harmonic and the sixth harmonic as well. In a sense, what they're doing is subtracting harmonics. So, uh, they tell violinists they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like that, actually. It's, it's a very bad move for scientists to approach musicians in that light. <laughs> uh, okay, so just one other thing about violins before we go on to say a bit more about the wind instruments. Um, the violin is a resonant system, of course. Uh, and there are various different uh, resonances associated with it. There's a resonances of the woodwork. And you can use, I won't bother doing it, you can use Audacity or Voce Vista to explore that kind of thing uh, just by tapping the thing lightly. There's a wooden, uh, so it's a rubber hammer, so it's not too... 
And you can actually look at the spectral content of that um, and, and, and see where the resonances are. But there's one resonance which is uh, an interesting one, which is the so-called Helmholtz resonance. Have you come across that uh, Helmholtz resonance? It's the classic example of a bottle. Uh, you blow across the end. Okay. Um, why is it doing that? Well, it's a bit like a mass on a spring, in fact. Um, the spring here is the big volume of air in there, which is a compliance, of course. Um, uh, so it, when air rushes in, this uh, compresses, the pressure goes up, and that exerts an excess pressure compared to the outside atmosphere, which tends to push the stuff back again, restoring force. Um, and so uh, the air, you just imagine the little air in the, here as a kind of little lumped mass. Um, then if that's forced in, uh, this compresses, pushes it back out again. As it rushes out, it sort of overshoots like a mass on a spring, uh, and the pressure here drops below atmospheric, so that sucks it back in again. And so you've got a characteristic resonant frequency. And so you can see that um, on here. If I just blow air across the bottle, you okay, see, so you've got one very strong resonance, and you can see what the resonance is. This, watch you, this will actually tell you what the frequency is there. So that was 262 hertz. Okay. Um, now, on the violin, also, there's the, the, the resonance, because the violin, like the guitar, has got, well, the guitar has got one large round hole normally uh, on the top plate, um, but some acoustic guitars have got F-shaped holes like this, uh, two holes, doesn't really matter particularly. Uh, that's effectively acting like the top of the bottle, and then the air inside this hollow cavity is acting like the volume of air with its compliance. And so, if you stop the strings, I don't know if you can hear it pitch there, a bomb, 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 bomb. But uh, actually, uh, one of the advantages of this small microphone is it's small enough to go into the airphone, the violin. So you can actually then just try blowing across it, like we did with the balloon, with the um, box rather. You can see that there is a characteristic frequency there. <coughs> it's about, it says 282 hertz. Right? So that's quite interesting because uh, that's actually just the, the frequency of there. So if I, um, maybe what uh, shall I do? Yes, I'll just blow air through it and then I'll just pluck the string. Okay? Uh, So you see that that resonance there is just about the same frequency as the D string of the violin. So that's quite important actually, and not uh, accidental. All violins have that characteristic, and that helps to reinforce the vibrations of the thing. Uh, another of my favorite little demonstration is uh, the importance of the bodywork, not just the air enclosed, but this. Uh, in radiating sound from something like a violin, it's fairly obvious that you need it because if you've got a very thin object, you can't create big sound waves. <clears throat> it's very easy to see. If you just think about uh, sticking this into a pond and trying to make big waves, it'll ripple right across the pond by just taking a thin needle and waving it backwards and forwards. You haven't got a big enough surface area to generate waves. In fact, for wavelengths which are uh, larger than the uh, diameter of the rod, uh, you don't get much uh, amplification. You, you, you simply get waves circulating around it. A big paddle is what you need to make big waves, and that's basically what the body of the guitar or the violin is. And um, this is a, a nice example of the importance of that uh, uh, resonance effect. It's not so much just resonance. And remember, resonance doesn't actually add any energy. Uh, resonance is a passive thing. An acoustic guitar has got no additional energy in it because it's got a nice big resonating box. 
you've got exactly the same amount of energy on the string once you've plucked the string. It's just a question of whether it uh, gradually dissipates itself as friction uh, or whether a lot more of it is radiated as sound. And the purpose of the resonating body is to convert that energy efficiently into sound. And so you need a big surface. Of course, the corollary is that um, it will decay much faster if it's radiating efficiently. And so there's a balance. Uh, with guitars, you can make uh, some resonances too strong, and then you get a really loud sound from the guitar, but it dies away very quickly. You know, it's, it's a bit boom, and it's suddenly gone. That's not what you want. You want boom. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, idea there. But here's a, a music box. It's got the same kind of problem as the string has. Tiny little thin metal prongs are plucked by little tines sticking out of the barrel. And it's pretty hard to hear, isn't it? Can you recognize the tune, Sir Christmas? Dick the Holes? Mm. Uh, no, it's... 12 Days of Christmas. It's 12 Days of Christmas, that one's right. It would be a lot easier if I just make it touch the bridge of the violin. <laughs> it's almost like switching an amplifier off, isn't it? But I'm not generating any more energy. I'm just turning it more efficiently into sound. Now, you might think, isn't it amazing how the box of a violin is so cleverly constructed to do that? But let's just try doing it on the table. It's maybe not such a wonderful sound, but it's still quite effective. It's, it's a big enough surface, and it's not totally rigid. And that's really what you need. OK, better leave the uh, uh, stringed instruments and... Um, I was told the one thing I mustn't do under any circumstances is go beyond 11 o'clock because that's when you have your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm definitely going to stop before then. Uh, okay, so uh, the wind instruments, well, there are various different kinds of wind instruments. Of course, there's instruments like the flutes and recorders that uh, we're familiar with. Um, I haven't got one of these with me, but I have got uh, this one, which is, I thought you might be interested just to see. It's a uh, uh, it's like a recorder, in fact, but it's made from an animal horn. And uh, it's uh, got holes in the side of it, like a recorder does, and a mouthpiece, which allows air to blow over a sharp edge. And the instability of that fluid flow uh, generates oscillations which make the instrument sound. <laughs> That's kind of gentle sort of sound, isn't it? Um, now, when we're on the subject, um, it's obviously very important that a uh, violin is made from the right kind of wood and has the right sort of uh, properties of resonance and so on, because we've just seen that what you're hearing is mostly not the sound of the string, but the actual sound of the woodwork vibrating. In a wind instrument, it's totally different, because what you're hearing there is not the sound of the body vibrating. The body does vibrate. Actually, you can feel the vibrations of the fingers, but you can't hear them. At least, there's a lot of scientific debate that's gone on for many years about whether listeners can actually hear the sound of the vibration of the body. And in certain circumstances, they can, but it's very, very small effect, and it's not really significant in most cases. So, uh, so long as the body is rigid enough, it doesn't really matter. And so uh, you can have an instrument like, you used, to use two instruments, okay? I mean, they, they, they could even have been taken from the same animal. They're both animal horns. <laughs> <laughs> but this one is made to play like a recorder with a flute-type mouthpiece. <laughs> but, uh, it's not a, a subliminal political message, by the way. There's a lower note, though. That sounds completely different. It's meant to play like a trumpet or a horn, actually. It's what you might expect to come out of a horn. Mm. Both, the, the walls are pretty well exactly the same. 
but the sound and the way of playing and everything is completely different. So um, that's just worth bearing in mind when we start talking about things like woodwind instruments and brass instruments. It's not really what they're made of that matters. Most flutes nowadays, although they're called woodwind instruments, are not made of wood, they're made of metal, uh, stainless steel or silver or whatever. Uh, and similarly, uh, there are instruments uh, made of brass, uh, like the saxophone, which is normally made of brass, which aren't classed as brass instruments, they're classed as woodwind instruments, so they're not made of wood. So um, it's not really the material that matters, um, it's how the instruments are sounded. And so we've seen that there's one class of instruments where there's just a, a kind of disturbance of the air, a periodic disturbance of the air uh, excites the resonances of the air column. And uh, one nice example of that is the, uh, this, this, uh, Now, this actually plays harmonics because it is a cylindrical tube open at both ends. So, synharmonic. Okay? Uh, so, if you, you do that on uh, one of these programs and measure the frequencies, you can show that they are actually harmonic. Um, this is a rather short one, so you can't play many tunes on it. Okay? It was longer, but the last time I did the demonstration, uh, it broke. <laughs> so uh, I can't play your bugle call on it, I'm sorry. Um, I have to get a new one. But uh, anyway, the interesting thing is it's corrugated. And if you do that with a smooth tube, you don't get any sound. The point is that uh, it's working because of uh, what you might call a centrifugal pumping, if you're... Uh, willing to risk the uh, <laughs> misunderstandings <laughs> involved in the term centrifugal. Uh, let's assume we know what we mean by that. Uh, okay? uh, I won't bother going into the discussion of putting yourself into a rotating reference frame and having uh, fictitious forces. Uh, but the net, the net effect is that when you do this, uh, there's an air sucked in from this end and thrown out from that end. Right? Um, and that means that there's an air count. You get the sound <laughs> just by blowing through it like that. Uh, and as the air flows over the corrugations, uh, there's little uh, turbulences created at each corrugation. And uh, so depending on the speed, uh, the frequency of which these corrugations uh, generate these instabilities uh, can coincide with one of the natural resonant modes of the tube. So just like with the string, I was wiggling it, and I just wiggled it at one of the resonant frequencies of the string, and I got a big response. So if this wiggling of the air as it goes through occurs at one of the resonant frequencies of the air column, you get a big response too. And that's why there's one note. If I go a bit faster, you don't get anything. Go a bit faster still, you get some more. Okay? So because the air is going faster over it, you get to the next resonance frequency. So that's a nice uh, idea. Another one is the, the reed. Um, I've got a reed in here. Get rid of that. That's two strips of plastic in this case, or sometimes it's cane. I've got a cane one here. Um, almost, but not quite, touching each other. <coughs> and when you blow air between them, uh, then Once you get a critical blowing pressure, it suddenly starts to oscillate on its own. All you have to do is blow hard enough. You know, you can get an electric pump and just blow it, and when you get to the high enough pressure, it starts to play. And there's an interesting uh, thing there. That's actually if I could borrow a couple of these sheets here. Um, it's a kind of Bernoulli effect. Uh, you know the Bernoulli effect? It's um, it's related to what keeps airplanes in the air, too. If you blow air across a surface, that reduces the pressure of the air on the surface, um, under the right circumstances, anyway. So, uh, for instance, if you just take two bits of paper and blow air between them, what do you think is going to happen? Are they going to get blown apart? No. They actually get stuck together. So, um, that's what happens in these reeds. Uh, steady. Um, the two strips, when you blow air through them, that creates a Bernoulli force on the inside which sucks them together. So eventually they, they touch each other and of course that stops the airflow, that stops the Bernoulli force, so it goes back to its natural uh, elastic state which is slightly open. 
then the airflow starts again and sucks it closed again. So there's a periodicity there, <coughs> uh, which uh, if you then couple it to an air column, uh, you then get a, a stabilization of the reed. Uh, the, 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 the standing wave that's set up here reacts back on the reed and more or less forces the reed to vibrate at one of the resonance frequencies of the air column. Under the right circumstances, anyway. So, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, I'll just take this off, and um, there you go. That's the kind of note, bum, 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 bum. So, we would expect that um, if we just blow, it's not too far off, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit higher, isn't it? Okay, but um, that's uh, the way that it operates. It's not necessarily exactly the resonance frequency of this, because this is, is, is a bit longer. So, if you don't blow quite hard enough, though, you get some interesting effects. Uh, uh, that's a multiphonic uh, <laughs> that you get, because um, the, the, the reed and the air column are no longer coupled together in that simple way. So it's just a reminder, you know, that the coupling between the two uh, is important. And if they're not agreeing on what to do, the natural resonance frequency of the reed and the natural resonance frequency of the air column, you can get funny effects happening in reed instruments. Uh, that, that reed is actually from an instrument like this. And I just want to show you that because I thought it'd be fun. Um, this one is called the Great Bass Racket. <laughs> Yes, there's a lot of debate about why it got that. <laughs> very low note, isn't it? And now that's the same reed that was playing that uh, very high pitch there. It's just an interesting illustration of how the reed itself is, can be captured when it's properly coupled to. Now, why do you think that's such a long note? Because actually, you know, this tube was, was longer than that. Any guesses? Uh, actually, the, the, the diameter of the, of, the, of the tube is a lot thinner, a lot narrower in here. Uh, it's got a clue at the bottom. Uh, yeah, there's a clue at the bottom there. <laughs> it, it doesn't actually just come out at the end. In fact, it's a very peculiar instrument, this one. Uh, on the bassoon, you get something like that. Uh, the air goes down, and then there's a kind of U-turn, and then it comes up again. But in this one, that happens nine times, so one... To, to, you know. So there's all sorts of complicated parallel bores in there, and it's several meters long if you opened it all out. So uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's just finish up with a little bit about um, uh, brass instruments, which is what I've actually been uh, studying for quite a long time. Um, the brass instruments are rather similar in the sense that uh, with that double reed uh, opening and closing and modulating the airflow. Um, let me just uh, see if I can find, actually I think the simplest place to find that is possibly uh, in that, uh, in here. if I just quickly look at this, um, uh, that's a uh, uh, if we just play this, it's a, a, an attempt by me to see what my lips were doing when I do the following thing. I, I take a trombone and I want to start a note. So what do I do? I get my lips buzzing like the reed. So put them together. Increase the pressure, it destabilizes and starts to vibrate. Okay? Put it in the mouthpiece. Uh, so, just by varying the uh, tension of my lips, I can change the natural resonance frequency of the lips. And that's just, uh, this is just sort of helping to stabilize it. But if I put it in here,
a set of harmonically related resonances, and it's very hard, actually, to pull the lips away from those. So it's a bit different to the woodwind instruments, where the reed is willing to play a very high note or a very low note. It's kind of flexible partner. I'll say, okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. Uh, whereas um, on the trombone, I say, well, I'll do it, but only if it's one of the notes I really want to play. Um, so there's a big cooperation. Uh, you have to set your lips, if you want a particular note, to roughly the right frequency. But if I went... It pulls it down. <laughs> uh, so um, you can see that sort of effect. In this, this is a high-speed uh, camera uh, through a transparent mouthpiece. I'm not going into the details, but this is looking uh, from the mouthpiece. So effectively, you're looking in that direction, okay? Uh, and you see what my lips do. I put my lips almost together with a little strip in between them, and then go, okay? And you'll see what happens. Uh, reduced by a, a, about a factor of um, 200, I think, in, in time. So the, I'm pulling my, my tongue back into my mouth. The lips are almost closing, but then the airflow starts. And you see that it's actually starts to run away. And for once, it, uh, it's quite weak until the standing wave starts to build up in the trombone, and then you get this strong pressure antinode building up in front, and you see what the effect is. It actually <laughs> forces it to... <laughs> 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 okay. That's right. Does anybody not feel like the coffee anymore? Is that some sea creature? Yes, I know. <laughs> anyway, yes, I... I I, I, I sometimes wonder when I show that to audiences of brass players whether I'm putting them off their instrument entirely. But, uh, <laughs> that's what's happening. Um, so uh, that's really important to get the resonances of the instrument uh, well in tune with the notes that the player wants to play. And of course, um, as I say, the, uh, the instrument is carefully constructed so that it will actually have a, a set of harmonically related resonances, or almost harmonically related. They're not perfect. But um, so. Now these are just the notes we were listening to with the harmonics I played on the computer earlier on. Now just one or two other things about that. Um, some instruments, like the trombone, uh, allow you to fill in the gaps between these notes, which are a bit far apart, of course. Uh, I wanted to play another note in the computer on the, a minute ago in the demonstration, and the trombone told me, no, sorry, I don't like that one. You're going to play the one I want. But I could have played it by moving the slide. So you've got this set of natural resonances. And then you can just move the slide out a little bit. You increase the total length. And if you remember this string, you know, if it's longer, uh, you can't change the speed of the wave. That's just the speed of sound. Like you can change the speed on a string by changing the tension. But you can change the length. So... set of harmonics, but they're all getting lower and lower in pitch as the tube gets longer and longer. And you do the same thing on a, on a trumpet, uh, but this time you do it with valves. You stick the valve down, that introduces a little bit of extra tubing. This puts in a bit more tubing. So it's just uh, like the like slide effect. But there is another way of doing it, which is like what we saw on the woodwind instruments, which is to open holes. And this hasn't actually been a very popular uh, way to do it with uh, brass instruments, but uh, it, there have been instruments which do that. This is the serpent. So, um, you know, if you close all the holes, set of resonant harmonics again. It's a conical tube this time, but a conical tube, if you look at the mathematics, a little bit more complicated because it's spherical waves, uh, spherical wave fronts rather than plane waves, but it still gives you a complete set of harmonic resonances. But if you open some holes on the side, 
Then, of course, it's a bit more complicated because the waves come along and then they find a leak. Now, if it's a very big hole, that effectively is just like cutting off the end of the tube. But if it's a fairly small hole, as it has to be in this because your finger's got to cover it, um, it has some very complicated effects. And if you look at the resonances, they're far from harmonic once a few holes are open. And that means that uh, the signals it sends back to the lips are not nearly as straightforward as the ones you get back from a trombone. So you can play a, a scale. Um, yeah. So, but I've, I've spent a lot of time practicing that. <laughs> and um, in fact, your lips are doing most of the work, uh, rather than in the case of the trombone, that being the dominant partner. Uh, I'll just play the same scale again, but I'll not work so hard. So it's exactly the same fingering. Okay, so that wouldn't get me any gigs. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just a, a one final thing. Um, yes, one final thing. One minute over time. Um, the brass instruments sound brassy. Now, uh, the trombone, if you play it loudly, or uh, let's take a, a, yeah, take a trombone. Okay, they, they, you won't bother looking at the harmonic spectrum, but you can imagine what you'll see if you do that. Um, it's quite a, only a few harmonics at the first one. But when you get to it really loud, you get a very, very brassy edge. And people describe that as brassy, and they used to think it was because the instrument was made of brass. But actually, it isn't. Um, if you take a purely cylindrical tube like this, and, uh, no, wait a minute, I've got a other mouthpiece somewhere. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's on the trumpet. Now, if you stick a pad of and fill on it, it uh, makes it really a little bit better. So you can get something like a trumpet. Okay, the, the tuning's not perfect, of course, because it's not a very carefully done thing, but you can still. Still sound brassy. And in fact, just recently we got these plastic trombones. Uh, it's made entirely of plastic, there's even a plastic mouthpiece, uh, but uh, the plastic mouthpiece is not very good, so uh, just use a mouthpiece I'm more familiar with. But, um, That sounds quite like a trombone, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And if you play it brassly, there's no doubt that the brassy effect is still there, despite the fact that the bell is entirely plastic. And in fact, interesting recent work has shown that it's nothing to do with the material it's made of. It's actually what they call nonlinear sound propagation in the bell. Uh, the sound level inside a brass instrument when you play it in the mouthpiece if you measure it uh, it's the pressure fluctuations are up to about a tenth of an atmosphere now that's uh, a much louder sound than you get if you were standing a few uh, meters in front of a jet engine you know it would blow your head off totally if you if you had your ear inside that mouthpiece fortunately uh, only a small fraction of the sound leaks out the end it's still can be dangerous actually, and orchestral players sitting in front of trombones usually have some kind of ear protectors on. But, uh, no, seriously, they do. But um, nevertheless, uh, these very, very high amplitudes uh, can generate shock waves, uh, just like you get, you know, in a. Um, uh, so, uh, in a sonic boom or something like that. So that's an interesting little bit of, uh, of, of physics which has helped us to understand better how brass instruments work. Uh, and I think by now I'm seriously stopping you getting your coffee, so I must stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>